I cannot applaud Angelina Jolie enough for not only taking charge of her own health and doing this operation, but also for being so open about it and letting the whole world know what she did and why she did it. Hello, welcome back to Gyno Info. Or if this is your first time, just welcome. I'm so glad you discovered us. In this podcast, we discuss common gynecological problems in a frank and open way that normal everyday women can understand without a medical dictionary. Here's another question that a listener sent to questions at gynoinfo.net, where you too can send any questions related to women's health you might have. I will then do my best to get to it in one of my next question and answer segments or use a whole episode to answer it like today. Keep looking out for it. So here is her question. How do birth control pills lower the risk of ovarian cancer? That's a good question. It's the very best of questions because it allows me to talk about a topic that is so near and dear to me. Many people, including even some medical professionals, still think that the pill increases the risk for cancer. When exactly the opposite is true for several different types of cancer, not just ovarian cancer, like our listener asks. Let me tell you now how birth control pills lower the risk of cancer of the ovaries and do this very effectively. Basically, anything that keeps you from ovulating, growing an egg in your ovaries every month, lowers your risk of developing cancer in the ovaries. Every time you ovulate, produce an egg inside a cyst that grows inside one of your ovaries. When that egg is ready, the cyst pops open and the egg jumps out, and that is called ovulation. Now, when that cyst pops during ovulation, that causes a little injury to the ovary. There will even be some bleeding sometimes that some women feel, others not. It's called ovulation pain, so-called Mittelschmerz in doctor's speech. Why doctors would use a German word for that is not clear, but it is what it is. So any time an injury occurs, in this case, it's an injury to the ovary from ovulation, the body has to repair it, heal it. Every time the body has to fix something, there is a chance of a mistake, of a screw up. That mistake is called a mutation. Mutations happen all the time. Specialized immune cells in the body act as guards against such mutations. They detect the mutant cells and then eliminate them. That is a good thing because mutations are a defective or out of control cell that can turn into cancer. Cancer cells are basically cells that no longer obey the rules of the body. They start growing unchecked and invade the spaces reserved for other cells and tissues and organs. They're uncontrolled invaders that do not respect the borders of other tissues. That's why we talk about invasive cancer. Now, when such a mutated cell escapes undetected by the immune system, it can start growing into a cancer, and in this case, it will be a cancer of the ovaries. So to say it short and clear, when there is no ovulation, there is no injury to the ovary, and there is no need to fix anything, and there is no chance to make a mistake can mutate, and so there's no ovarian cancer. That is why anything that keeps you from ovulating lowers your risk of developing cancer in the ovaries. That can be birth control pills that work after all by stopping ovulation. And this is the question that I'm answering. But it can also be pregnancies. You don't make eggs and ovulate when you're carrying a baby. The womb is already occupied. Or it can be cause of breastfeeding, though that's a little bit trickier. It only works as long as you feed your baby nothing else but breast milk, not adding any formula at all. And you have to nurse your baby at least every four hours during the day and at least every six hours at night. You also need to actually nurse your baby. Pumping and giving the milk to your baby in a bottle will not trick your body into not ovulating. And as most babies will start eating some solids after about six months, breastfeeding will not stop your ovulation much past six months. This is also why nursing is not a reliable birth control method once the baby starts eating or drinking anything other than breast milk and stops nursing frequently enough to suppress ovulation. Now, the longer you take the pill or the more 
children you have, especially if you nurse them each for as long as possible, the lower your risk of ovarian cancer will be. This is a birth control benefit that lasts for at least 30 years and probably the rest of your life. Unlike some other pill benefits, like less acne and better skin, less bleeding, milder cramps, bleeding regularly every 28 days, and also being able to move your periods for vacation and important events, and suppressing endometriosis and adomiosis, lining of the uterus growing inside the wall of the uterus or outside the uterus, causing painful bleeding and scarring. We'll soon do an episode on endometriosis. All these extra pill benefits will all disappear as soon as you stop taking the pill. But if you have taken the pill for about 10 years and then never again, you still have less than half the risk of cancer of the ovary more than 30 years later than your neighbor who never took the pill at all. Unless, of course, she had at least five kids and nursed each of them for a year. Taking the pill is definitely a lot easier. Taking birth control pills for about a decade also lowers your risk of cancer of the lining of the uterus, called endometrial cancer, by about a third. And it lowers colon cancer, cancer of the large bowel, by about one-fifth. And very important, and that's really exciting, this cancer protection effect by the birth control pill also holds true for women who have a genetic mutation that increases their risk for both ovarian and breast cancer, and even for some others. Those are the so-called BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations that are passed on from parents to children. And you can get it from your father or from your mother. By the way, that's the kind of genetic issue that Angelina Jolie had. Women with these kind of mutations, BRCA1 or 2, should take birth control pills until they are ready to get pregnant. While they're on the pill, they have a lower risk of developing cancer of the ovaries. After they are finished with their family planning and have all the children they want, or by about 40 at the very latest, they should seriously consider removing their ovaries and their tubes. That's because the very worst type of so-called ovarian cancer actually started in the tubes. That is why we now always remove the tubes every time we take out the uterus. Removing the uterus is called hysterectomy in doctor speech, and it means only the uterus is removed and not the ovaries. In a woman who does not have a BRCA mutation, the ovaries do not have to be taken out before menopause. This was actually the usual move in the past whenever a woman had a hysterectomy, no matter how young she was. But the ovaries can continue to work and make important hormones for many years until menopause, even after the uterus is taken out. For that reason, the ovaries should not automatically be removed unless you have one of those mutations. Please remember to discuss this with your doctor if ever you are going to have to have a hysterectomy. But the tubes should be taken out every time according to all up-to-date guidelines. Removing the ovaries in a woman with a BRCA mutation will cut her ovarian cancer risk by as much as 80%, depending on whether she has a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation. But it is then important that she be treated with hormones, because removing ovaries that are still working in women in her 40s leads to instant menopause, with all its super unpleasant symptoms and all the risks of not treating it. Also, women with these mutations should seriously consider having their breasts replaced with nice perky implants. After all, BRCA mutations make the risk for both ovary and breast cancer much higher than not having the mutation. Removing the breast tissue with or without implants will reduce their breast cancer risk by over 90%. It is what Angelina Jolie decided to do, but of course, with implants. This is the recommendation of all the most up-to-date medical guidelines. I cannot applaud Angelina Jolie enough for not only taking charge of her own health and doing this operation, but also for being so open about it 
and letting the whole world know what she did and why she did it. She used her fame in the best possible way. She used it to reach millions of women and teach them something that probably saved thousands of lives. Ms. Jolie's bravery has not only informed so many women about the fact that this particularly dangerous mutation exists, it also taught the women of the world that there is nothing to be ashamed of by talking about it and that they are not powerless victims, but that they can take charge and act and defend their health and their lives. And it certainly made my job and the job of countless gynecologists a lot easier. It used to take a lot of time to convince women with several breast and ovarian and other cancers in their family history to even consider genetic testing for the two BRCA mutations and also some other mutations that can be done nowadays. Let alone begin to talk with them about having their breasts or ovaries removed when their test results showed that they indeed had the mutations. Now, all I have to do is mention the name Angelina Jolie, and they are ready to start talking and asking questions. And of course, this discussion still has to take a lot of time. It is not a decision anybody wants or should be making lightly. It is never an emergency, and one can take all the time needed to think of everything through carefully. But thanks to Angelina Jolie, it's now so much easier to get started with this all-important conversation. In Switzerland, where I practice now, the insurance companies will not even pay for the genetic testing unless somebody is first thoroughly counseled and had a chance to have all their questions answered by a cancer geneticist, a person specialized in cancer genetics. I send all women to genetic specialists after they have decided that they want to know where they're at and if they have this mutation or not. And not all women end up wanting to be tested and know if they are at the high risk. That is perfectly okay, though not what I would choose. But the decision not to want to know has to be made with all the information available. After the test comes back, the women get another meeting with a specialist to discuss the result and what their options are. If the test shows that they do not have the mutation, their risk is slightly higher than if nobody in their close family had cancer, so they need to be carefully watched. And if the test shows that they do have mutation, then there are several options for them. They can have the surgery I already mentioned, either now or later, depending on where they are with their family planning. They might even decide to speed up having kids so they can go ahead then with the surgery earlier. Or they can start a very intensive surveillance program being checked every six months or so in the hope of detecting any cancer they develop in the earliest possible stages. And they can start on birth control pills if they are not already on them to lower their risk of cancer in the ovaries, uterus, and bowel, all of which are higher in women with both types of BRCA mutations, BRCA1 and 2. There is, however, no information that there is a protection from breast cancer for them by taking birth control pills. Then there is, of course, always the question of who of their blood relatives should and wants to be tested, sisters, brothers, aunts, but also uncles, brothers, and son. Not only can men pass on the gene to their children, but they can actually develop breast cancers themselves. Not ovarian cancers, of course, because men have no ovaries but breast cancers do occur in men. And a breast cancer in a man is always highly suspicious for a BRCA mutation in the family. So now you can see why I love this listener's question. It gave me the chance to talk about some really important things. It gave me the chance to teach you that birth control pills are not the evil cancer-causing devils they get generally painted as. And also how much I admire Angelina Jolie for her courage on this topic. Besides actually cutting the risk of ovarian cancers in half for the great majority of women, including the ones with BRCA genes, that greatly increase their risk for ovarian cancer, birth control pills have many other so-called non-contraceptive benefits, benefits other than just reliable birth control. This brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you liked it and it gave you a lot of information that is useful to you or your friends. And if you have any further questions about birth control pills, gynecological cancer and cancer genes, 
or any other topic having to do with women's health, please don't hesitate to send it to me at questions at gynoinfo.net. Again, that's questions at gynoinfo.net. And if you like these questions, please give us a lot of likes and share it around. It will also be super nice if you could subscribe to GynoInfo. This actually helps Josh and me to keep this podcast going. Thank you. Until next time. Thank you for listening. And remember that you and your health are super important and deserve your full attention. Don't ever put off contacting your doctor because you're scared or embarrassed when something feels wrong about your body. Doctors are here to help you, not to judge you. And also, regular well woman visits are always a good idea that you should make time for. You deserve it, and you owe it to yourself, and you owe it to your body and your health. This podcast is part of Pride House Media, hosted by me, Dr. Berkey, produced and edited by Josh Rosenzweig, original music composed by Nell Balaban. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, leave us a rating and a review. It really helps others discover the show. Stay connected and join the conversation by following me on Instagram and Facebook at GynoInfo and on LinkedIn at GynoInfo Podcast. Remember, any questions that I answer or information that I give you on this podcast are to be understood as information only, not treatment of your medical problems. While I'm a very knowledgeable gynecologist, I'm not your gynecologist who has talked to you and examined you personally and is therefore actually able to treat you. So please consult your own healthcare professional with any medical questions or concerns.